Hi guys, welcome to unit one. So we've made it there. Uh, just a quick review of what's coming up in this unit. So we start with some introduction to functions, talk about notation, domain and range, all sorts of stuff. So some of this is gonna look like review from algebra one, some will be brand new. So with day one, where we start with are just examples of what counts as a function versus what does not. And that kind of helps clarify like, what are we talking about? Before we talk about functions specifically, a more general category, a relation, that's just a set of ordered pairs. So basically any set of like x, y points, right? Um, so all functions fit into the category of being a relation, but not necessarily the other way around. So given here, you have three different examples that are functions on the left side and that are not functions on the right side. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to figure out, all right, what's the difference between them? So as you're scanning your paper and trying to recall back to algebra one, probably some things might be starting to come to mind. But when we look at the set of ordered pairs, we have the point one, two, two, three, four, two, this counts as a function. Whereas over here you have two, three, two, seven, one, three. So hopefully what you're noticing is the fact that over here, you have a repeated X value that goes to two different Y's. That's like plugging into an equation and getting three the first time, plugging that same number back in and getting a seven the second time. That's no good, all right? So the reason this is not a function is because you have repeated x values, right? That match to different y values. Whereas over here, all the x values are different. Or more importantly, do not repeat. All right. Graphically, everybody typically remembers this test. It's the idea there's a way to test to see if something is a function. And it's by drawing a line through the graph in a specific way. So what that is called, sometimes it's abbreviated to the VLT, but it is known as the vertical line test. And if you can draw a vertical line anywhere in the graph and it only hits the graph one time, then we say it passes the vertical line test. Whereas if you draw a line vertically through and it hits in more than one spot, like in this case it hits twice, then we would say it fails the vertical line test. So if it fails it, not a function. Mm -hmm. The next one is given in little sets here of inputs and outputs. And as we look, this set counts as a function whereas this set over here doesn't. It kind of goes back to that first um, example where you have repeated X's or not. Here, every value in the input only goes to one value of the output. Whereas in the second set, if you look, the number one is matched to eight and matched to 10, and you can't have that, all right? So you have one input matched to multiple outputs, all right? So that's a big, that's a big no-no right there, all right? Whereas here, each input only matches to one output. The fact that there's an output that's doubled, that's okay, that's not a big deal, all right? So down at the bottom, under our little conclusion step, let me reference my notes to make sure I say it correctly, all right? How we're gonna wanna say this here is a function is a relation, where each x value, I'm gonna say maps or matches to exactly one y value. So each x matches to exactly one y value. Mm -hmm. Then it says the rules can be expressed in different ways, most common being equations, graphs, tables, and it's saying we call the input variable. That is our typically our x, but it's called the independent variable. And that's our x there. And then the output variable, our y, is the dependent. And the reason for it, x can be anything it wants. 
the Y depends on the X value that you plug in, right? And then the last thing, we mentioned it already, but it's good to note here, to determine if a graph is a function, we use the vertical line test. Yahoo, so hopefully that seems pretty familiar. We're pretty comfortable with it. All right, let me slide this back down for a moment. Let me come back over here. All right, let's go ahead and switch on over to the next page. So on the next page, there's some practice. Let me come back down here. It's saying determine if the following graphs represent functions. If not, you should be able to justify. So here, what we're using is that vertical line test. So with each one, you should be able to quick take a look through it and answer. So you kind of have this sideways absolute value going on here. The best way to be able to get that to happen would be, excuse me, to be able to use a piecewise function, but we'll talk about that later. But if I draw a vertical line, it hits in two spots. So when it says, is this a function? I would say no, because it fails the vertical line test. All right, whereas the second one, draw it through anywhere you want, it's only hitting once. And the picture might be a little rough. It's just that little semicircle right there, right? And so this one, we can say, yes, it passes the vertical line test. The last one, it sort of looks like a trapezoid almost. You have this, 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 there is no bottom to it. Again, this would be given by a piecewise function where a piece of it is this line and another piece is that line and so on, right? And anywhere I draw a vertical line through, it should only hit in one spot. So we can say, yes, again, this one passes the vertical line test. All right, really going back to kind of some algebra one stuff here. This next little section references kind of a basic word problem that you would probably remember from Algebra 1. So the information that's given, it's saying an internet music service offers a plan where users pay a flat monthly fee, five bucks, and then they can download songs for 10 cents each. So obviously music platforms have come a long way, but it used to look something like this. You know, iTunes, it used to be like 99 cents a song, things like that, all right? Um, when it's saying, what are the independent and dependent variables in the scenario? All right. Well, you got to think, we're talking about how much music you can um, purchase and then the cost. So in this case, the X or the independent should be the number of songs. Oops. Sorry there. That you can actually purchase. And then the dependent, that's the Y value. Mm -hmm that's going to be how much it costs you. So the cost or the money, all right, per month. All right, so it says fill in the table. I just want you to do some quick calculations. So they're saying it costs you $5 flat fee. So that means you're paying $5 up front and then downloading from there. So even if you download zero songs, it's going to cost you $5. If you download five songs at 10 cents a piece, that's a whopping 50 cents on top of that, right? So this should come up to then $6 even. And then if we're at 20 songs, um, what would that be? 10, 20, so what, $7? All right. Hopefully none of my mental math is falling apart there on us. Okay, the next part, when it says, let the number, let me shift a little, of downloads be represented by the variable X, and the amount charged be represented by Y. That's what we said back up in part A. Write an equation that models it. Mm -hmm. So what I want you to think of is, it costs how much based on the number of downloads? Mm -hmm. So as you think through it, you wanna think it's gonna cost you $5 no matter what, and then plus how much on top of that. So think about it for a second, see if you can fill that in. I'm just gonna double check and make sure that our screen is looking good, and it is awesome, all right? So $5, and then it should be 10 cents per song. So keep in mind, 0.10 and then times X. And then can we change it up? I realize I wrote it half in cost and half in variables, so let me fix that. So Y would be equal to five plus 0.10 X. Could you make it 0.10 X and then plus five? Of course, all right? So you can kind of rearrange those a little bit. All right, the last part, we have a little graphing to do. Something to keep in mind with this is as we, whoops, as we do the graphing, right? Sorry, I just wanted to double check. 
kind of going back and forth on my computer here as I'm talking to you guys. I just wanted to double check that you could see it, okay. Um, with this here, it says produce a graph for the function for all values of x on the interval from 0 to 40. So this here would be a linear function where it would extend forever. They're saying we only want to see it between 0 and 40. So in our chart, we already got 0 to 20. So at 0, we know we're at $5. At 20, we know we're up to $7. I gotta look really carefully because my eyes will jump otherwise, all right? And so then you can extend from there to hit 40, or you could calculate for 40 what that would be equal to, all right? The other thing is, could you put this into your Y1 and then go into your table of values and then say, all right, what's my X and my Y? So since I happen to have my calculator sitting here, of course, I can do that for us real quick so you can see it. So if I do 5 plus 0.10x, and then I could go to my table of values. Right? So there's oops, my 5 at 0. There's the 5. Um, I'm going to jump in my table. I'm going to have it start down here at 40. Oops. I can look at the graph too. So it's going to look like a slowly increasing line. Let me go back to that table there. There we go. And at 40, it's up to $9. So 40 is 9. At um, 0, it was 5. And we knew at 20, it was 7. So that should make sense, kind of the way it's incrementally growing here. Each of these tick marks, I believe, stands for 50 cents. So you're graphing it as best you can. If you have a straight edge, even better. Otherwise, as steady as you can be, go for it. All right, and because it's specifically said to graph from 0 to 40, that means you're actually going to be using endpoints, right, at x equals 0 and x equals 40 and not arrows. We don't usually do that, but when they give you that specific um, values or those specific values of x, they're limiting your domain, all right, because that's your x values, then you want to make sure to show that graphically. Let's keep on moving. On to the next page. This exercise two right here, let me switch back for a moment. We are gonna save this for a little recap for class. So we're gonna skip over this, parts A, B, and C. All right, so hold on to that. And then down at the bottom, you're gonna notice that your typed notes kinda end and then there's a blank page, but we're not done yet. So we're gonna pick up right down at the bottom where it says function notation. So where it says function notation, let's actually talk about hopefully some stuff that you guys remember from Algebra 1. So first of all, when we see function notation, we read this as y equals f of x. All right, so it reads as f of x. And that f stands for function, that y is a function of x. It changes depending on what x is. So x is our input, y, or f of x, is our output. And so you can use those interchangeably. Y stands for the exact same thing as f of x. Right? So then why would we have a new notation? All right, well, it's kind of nice. So as an example, all right, so let's say for a given point. So let's say it's the point, you know, like three negative two, something like that. In function notation, It reads as f of 3 equals negative 2. So here's my little x and my y. In there's the x. Out here is the y. So it kind of nicely shows you like what your x and y values are right there all in one notation. So that's one advantage to that function notation. Mm -hmm. So let's do some practice. So if I say, all right, excuse me, let's give ourselves an example down here. Let's evaluate using a rule. So if I want to use, you know, y equals x squared minus 4, let's write it with that function notation. This would just look like f of x equals x squared minus 4. So we're just giving ourselves an example to work with. Those both mean the same thing. So now when I say for part a, evaluate f of 12, in that tiny little notation, I'm giving you direction to plug in x equals 12 and tell me what number comes out. Mm -hmm. 
So that's what that actually means. So let's do it. If we put in 12, square it, you might be mental mathing it. You can pick up your calculator if you prefer. But that should be our answer right there. So what that means is a couple things. It means that we can say f of 12 equals 140, but it really means that the point 12 comma 140 is on the graph of f of x. So if you were to graph this thing, that is a coordinate point on that graph. So let's do one more like that. If I tell you to do f of negative 1, take a second, calculate it, let's see what you come out with here. And if you're using your calculator, please be cautious. When you square a negative number, I don't care what your calculator tells you, it comes out positive. So if I tell my calculator, and I will show you guys right here, if I tell my calculator, and let me just double check and make sure I'm on, oops, on the screen with you guys, I am, okay. Um, if I plug in negative one and then square it, it gives me negative one. But what I'm really trying to tell the calculator is in parentheses, take negative one, that whole thing, and square it. Otherwise, what my calculator is doing is squaring it and then negating the value. It's kind of like a little order of operations quirk. So that really gives me one and then minus four and I get negative three, just like that. So let me flip here for myself. Mm -hmm. So what that means, just like it did for the last one, it means that I can say f of negative one equals negative three and that the point negative one, negative three is on the graph. So it gives you a nice visual there. Now, there are some cool things that we can do with the calculator to be able to get it to evaluate. Um, I mean, let me just double check and see if I want to take the time now or if we'll save it for class. I was thinking maybe we'll save this part for class and we can talk about it tomorrow. So maybe we'll save that part. And then let's do the one last thing. So go ahead and flip it on over. You have one more page in your notes that's completely blank. And I do want to show you one little thing. So I'm going to give you a couple different functions. And what I want you to do for this last example is I want you to evaluate each for the value of x equals 3. Right? So if I give you that g of x, because it's not always f of x, sometimes it's g of x, equals 2x plus 9, something I know that you're very capable of is you can simply say, okay, I'm just going to put in 3, and I can calculate my answer from there, easy peasy. What I want to show you is if you're going to evaluate for the same number over and over again, which in this case we are, or if it's a really messy number, so like, let's say I gave you 3.2781, something that you wouldn't want to have to type into your calculator over and over and over again. Something that we can do is we can take a value and we can store a value in X on the calculator. All right. So even though three is really simple, just for the practice sake of it, let me show this to you guys. So when we look at it, if I go into my calculator to be able to get it to store right now, whether you realize it or not, there already is a number stored in X it has never affected you. So it's only going to affect you when you type in an X on the home screen. So if you want to know what number's in there right now, hit X and just hit enter. So for mine, it's 20. I think the calculator defaults to 10, but everybody's calculator could have been used before. So there might be something different. So let's make it so that we all match. So I want you to hit the number three on your home screen. Let me zoom in a little bit to make sure that you can see me okay here. And then you're going to hit the store button. So I'm going to slide up so you can see it. So it's S-T-O with the arrow. It's right above the on button, that guy right there. So hit store, and then what's going to pop up is that arrow, right? So it's S-T-O with the arrow. That's the button that you're looking for. And then hit X. So the X is just this X right here, all right? And then once you hit enter, now if you hit X and hit enter, three is what pops up because you've stored three to be your X value. So now if I want to calculate 2X plus 9, I could literally just type in 2X plus 9, 
and there I go, right? Now for something simple like this last one, maybe not the most useful trick I've ever shown you, but we're gonna see things in future units where maybe the number is messy, or maybe it's a decimal that keeps on going and going and going. It will be nice and helpful to be able to store those numbers and then be able to keep going. So it's just a fun trick. So for the second part, I just want you to try it, right? So I'm gonna give you, in this next one, let's do h of x equals x cubed minus four. Go ahead and evaluate that for three. So I'm essentially asking you to plug three in here. So you can mental math it, and I also want you to try it on your calculator. So right now you can type in x cubed and then minus four, and it should give you the same thing as if you had done three cubed and then minus four. There you go, all right? So it should come out as 23. So we'll kind of slowly talk about what are some nice, helpful calculator tricks that you know you can use throughout time. And then um, let's see if there's any last thing. I don't think so. I think that's it. I think the other things we will cover in class, um, and that's that quick recap, and then the one other thing with being able to evaluate. All right, guys, have a great day. Don't forget to finish by answering the post video question. Thanks.